So here today to talk about embedding executive functions into assignments, which is a way to help our students and especially our neurodiverse students uh, do a better job of being able to get over some of the logistical hurdles of their assignments so that they can show you what they know and really live up to their potential. So first of all, what are executive functions? These are the 12 sort of big executive functions that are involved in the frontal lobe of our brain. Now, many of these don't even fully develop until people are closer to age 25. So even if your students are not lacking in executive functions due to some external reasons such as ADHD or a learning disability, they may still not have all of these. Also, these are things that you can build and skills you can work on and our current K-12 system doesn't always spend as much time on them as could be useful. Some of the ones that are really specific to the assignments that we'll be talking about include things like self-restraint, focus, task initiation, or getting yourself going on something, planning and prioritizing, organizing, time management, which is one of those ones that's really hard for people when you have something that's long and they have to see it across a broad time scale, defining and achieving goals, Flexibility, which even includes things like having to make shifts as you're going. Observation, noticing what you're doing. And even though I don't specifically deal with things like emotion control and stress tolerance, just being able to deal with these other ones will help people with those as well. So why should we embed executive functions to the assignments? Well, as you can see from the executive functions, these are key drivers for completing assignments. When students get stuck on assignments, it's not typically that they don't know the content, it's that they are unable to use the executive functions to accomplish the goals. And these are the key areas where students regularly get stuck. They don't know how to get started, they don't know the next step, they don't know where they're going, they don't do a good job of planning. This is really specific for students who are neurodiverse, that includes students with ADHD, students with autism, students with learning disabilities, things like that. But in general, it provides more clarity, more shared understanding, and will help more of your students understand what you want, which will help them show you what they can do. All right, so what are the things we're gonna go over? I have six major things that I think should be included. Purpose of the assignment, description of the finished product, tools and resources needed, steps and timeline for implementation, suggestions for review and revision, a statement of high expectations and support. And I'm gonna go through each of these. So the purpose of the assignment is the why behind the work. This is something that is often very implicit in our assignments, but I don't see a reason why we shouldn't just explicitly state it. It helps the student understand the goals. They understand the process of learning. If the assignment is so they practice looking something up or practice putting something together, that's something they should know. It helps them understand which content is involved. Are they supposed to use content from class or find content outside of class? And it helps them understand the goal for assessment. Are we giving them this assignment because we want them to do it, learn from it and improve upon it, or so we can see where they have gotten to? And knowing which of those two things, whether it is formative, the learning type or summative, the sort of final assessment type is key. It also aids with interest and activation. If they understand what they're trying to do, it is easier to jump over that hurdle of should I get started on this because you can say, oh, I'm gonna learn a skill from this or oh, I'm gonna go find out something cool about this. Or even if it's, oh, my grade depends on this, at least you know where they're coming from. It is key to have a description of the finished product. It is very hard for people with neurodivergence to get from well, this is sort of what I want you to do to here is what it looks like at the end. So be very clear about what you want. An expected mode is important. Is it something that's going to be written out? Is it going to be a file? Is it going to be emailed? Is it going to be uploaded? Is it a presentation? Is it a portfolio? What is it going to physically or digitally look like? How long should it be? And even if you don't have a length requirement, giving a length approximation is often helpful for students who are just uncertain. So maybe it's words, page numbers, a time limit. It could be very a lot of different things. Be sure to include any required details that are necessary. So if you have particular things you want for font, font spacing, layouts, do they need a certain number or lack of visuals? Do they need references of certain kinds? Make sure all of that is very, very clear. Again, anything that's implicit 
is hard for people with neurodivergence to figure out. So treat it like a checklist. Did you do this? Did you do this? Did you do this? If you can, provide an example. If you have previous student work that you are allowed to use without their name, that's great. Or write one of your own, which can also give you a sense of maybe how long certain things take when you give an assignment a try once. If you need to, do it on a topic that's just slightly outside the scope of your class and remind the students that that's not what they're working on, but they should do something related. Tools and resources needed is something that does not get spelled out nearly enough in assignments. In some cases, it's technology, specific computer programs. Sometimes you have to use something very particular, but even just reminding our students that they need a good word processor is sometimes important for a written assignment. Do they need to have something physical? Do they need to print out what they're doing, in which case they need to know ahead of time? Do they need to staple it? If they're making something, what supplies are they going to need? Do they have those supplies at home, or do they have to plan to be on campus in a certain way? What kind of sources do they need? If they're expected to only use class sources like the textbook or things provided on Brightspace, then being clear about that will help them not go overboard or get confused by looking up external sources. But if they need external sources, then we should point them directly to those sources. What library databases would be best to use? If you're using the internet, what type of internet, what types of sources, how do you find them? And then finally, people are great resources. And letting them know where they're allowed to work with people and which types of people is helpful. Can you get together with your peers and go over this? That's a resource. Can you go over this with a tutor? That's a resource. Can you go see your professor? Also a resource. Steps and timeline for implementation really helps students with that getting started part. Many times my students tell me the thing they don't know how to do is begin so I try to give them beginning steps and very clear ones, things that are action steps and not just research this. That's kind of a confusing step for a student who hasn't done very much research before. And I try to include a time frame so they don't get lost in the shuffle. If they're trying to figure out a topic, brainstorm for 15 minutes is a good way to start that. You tell them just write down everything for a while, then you can sort it out. At least then you're getting somewhere. You should be looking things up for research purposes Say, you should look things up in the library database for a period of time. Tell them to read and take notes on for a period of time. Write an outline of what you're going to do. If you're willing to give them the entire set of steps, that's great. If you'd rather give them a few starting steps and then see where people end up, because sometimes assignments are a little bit more broad, you can. If it's going to be a longer assignment, it takes a few weeks or more to get through, give an overall timeline. Where are the check-in points? Where should you be at about week five? Where should you be at about week eight? Things like that to remind students of where and what they should have done. Suggestions for review and revision. Remind your students that review of unfinished work is actually a good idea. Students get very nervous that they're going to show you something that's not done or not perfect or not great. And I want to keep saying, I want to see it when it's still bad, when you're still working on it, so that we can work on that. And if they don't want to show it to you, Give them ideas, suggest regular informal peer review, or even hold informal peer review as part of your class. Give some of the guidelines and timeframes for when you want to look at something. And if you can scaffold, I very often collect an outline first and then give them feedback and then a draft and then give them feedback and they can really get their head around the idea of review and revision. And or they could use the learning commons, go see a tutor, go talk to the writing lab, and specify if you think that, that is a key thing and when it should be done by. Finally, let the students know that, yeah, we're giving them something hard to do. It's going to take work. It's going to take time. But we think it's important, and we know that they are capable of doing it, and we would want to see good work out of them. The goal of this is not to drive the students crazy. It is for them to learn something and for us to be able to see that they've learned something. And so if we can be very clear that we want them to do well, that helps them. They don't think they're doing busy work. They know that they're going to learn something out of it. And they know that you care that their work is good and not just that you're giving assignments away to mark a grade off of a book. So in conclusion, each of these things helps remove a barrier and help get a student unstuck. Just having extra little pieces of information to jog an executive function or get you over a hump or say, here's how to begin will work. 
And not every piece of what I talked about would be needed for every assignment. You can start small. You can add things in as needed. You can throw a purpose on something, but not necessarily scaffold it out. This gives you a place to begin. Some assignments might not need a full series of steps, but maybe just one little here's how to get started will help 10 more students know what they're doing. And provide this information to them in various forms. Maybe you have a short assignment sheet and a longer one for the ones who need a little bit more explanation. When possible, I try to make a video of what I want them to do in the assignment, as in I'll walk through the assignment sheet so they can hear me talk about it, which can help them. Sometimes I'll even start the assignment myself and say, OK, I'm going to go do this piece of research, show you how to do an outline, show you how to get started on how to brainstorm a topic. Anything that gives them that extra bit of, oh, that's how I do that, will get them there. And really, the goal is that we see the work they can do, they learn something, they live up to their potential, and we get to provide assignments and assessments that everybody feels good about. So hope you can incorporate some of these into your future classes.